Happy Halloween, ghoul gang. Hope you all have a brilliant spooky time, not just today, but the whole year round. For me personally, I love the nostalgia of Halloween, the tradition of it, and every year it makes me want to travel back to the roots of horror. That's what I'm going to do in this year's Halloween video, as at long last I break down the widely recognised first great horror movie. This is why the cabinet of Dr Caligari is nightmare fuel. That's right, we're heading back to 1920, to the early years of feature film. It's such a fascinating time to go back to for me, being able to look at the world over a century ago. That'll never stop being magical to me. However, the world that Caligari creates is far from the real world. Instead, what we experience is a nightmare realm of twisted architecture, painted shadows, and a distorted landscape. That's right, German expressionism. This is a cinematic technique that Caligari is seen as the quintessential example of, and is a style that Tim Burton adopted in the direction of many of his works. It creates such a bizarre atmosphere that you can get wrapped up and lost within. Watching Caligari in the right circumstances can teleport you to a hypnotic, dreamlike realm, encompassing you in mystique. And then when it backs up that realm with the introduction of horror movie tropes, that's when Caligari's fuel blends into the nightmare variety. Though some audiences may likely find it tame by today's standards, it's no wonder why the film was received well by audiences in 1920. For its time, there hadn't been another film quite like it. This was, in effect, a feature-length slasher film with a twist ending. A very twisty ending. The film is mostly made up of a flashback story told by a man named Francis. While in a park, he tells an old man that spirits have separated him from his family, and when he sees a seemingly hypnotic woman, he claims that she is his fiancée Jane, and that they have both suffered. Why exactly? That's what he goes on to tell. Dr Caligari is a performance act who arrives at the town fair wanting to put on a show. The show he puts on is revealing his prized possession, Caesar, played by Conrad Veidt. He's a somnambulist, a sleepwalker, a figure of strangeness. But when Caligari's request to perform at the fair is accepted, it's done mockingly. Caligari is laughed at, and he doesn't like that. So that very night, the man who accepted Caligari's permit winds up getting stabbed to death. That's what's up. A dark circus act with murderous capabilities, taking place in a disjointed puzzle of a world. What a brilliant setup for a horror film, and also a shocking one. Audiences had the First World War fresh in their minds. They had some very real nightmares to deal with on a daily basis. So for Caligari to have an impact with those audiences and shock them, that's a testament to the film's strengths of getting under the skin. What's even more frightening is that the baseline principle of the film is based on a real observation by the film's co-writer Hans Janowitz. He went to a carnival one day and noticed a man creeping around in an abnormal manner. Later it was revealed that a girl was murdered at the carnival. Then at the funeral Janowitz saw that same man creeping around again. Though there was no proof that the man and the murder were linked, this was a spark in the imagination for Janowitz to begin building Caligari. The impetus for this film's creation is a stranger with a threatening aura, a brutal murder, and the unknown. The ingredients of real-world nightmare fuel that were the building blocks for the rest of the film around it, and that knowledge makes Caligari all the more chilling to watch. The murderous nature of the film continues when Caesar is unleashed on a live audience at the fair, and provoked to answer questions. When asked by a man named Alan how long he's going to live, Caesar answers that he will die at dawn. He is too murdered. We've established a body count here, one of the genre's most important traits, but down the line we also get another often seen characteristic of not just horror, but cinema in general. Caesar goes to kill Jane in a bloody creepy sequence where he strides towards her. There's a couple points in the film where he does this, walking around like an apparition, and it's remarkably off-putting, like he's a puppet being manipulated by Caligari's strings. When he goes to kill Jane, he refrains from plunging his knife into her, instead becoming attracted to her. This is a beauty and beast dynamic that, despite being often seen in literature, this is one of the earliest cinematic applications of the monster being in love with the girl, something we see in later films like The Hunchback of Notre Dame, The Phantom of the Opera, and perhaps most famously, King Kong. We even get a chase sequence across rooftops, something which has become somewhat of a smaller movie trait in itself. Just look at the design of some of these visuals, by the way. I think it's wonderful 
wonderful to look at and makes me wonder how they were achieved. No AI here, this is all from the dark corners of the human imagination. Not only do I find that more wonderful, but scarier too. It's one of early cinema's most influential styles, but it's built on bending reality and converting almost everything into being barely regular, yet still recognisable, plus a sprinkling of a time long lost. We are witnessing the permanent creative echoes of the shadowy corners of the mind, and that is bloody crazy to me. Crazy being the key word, especially when it comes to the climax of the film. Caesar drops dead following the rooftop chase after a dummy Caesar has been put in the coffin box as an alibi for the murderous activities. Francis tracks Caligari to an insane asylum. This is where things get really complex and multi-layered, extremely bold for a cinematic narrative of the time. It turns out that Caligari is the director of the asylum. He's not really Caligari, he's been replicating the story of a man named Caligari and his murderous somnambulist Caesar with a somnambulist who was admitted to the asylum. He obsessively proclaims that he must become Caligari, but when Caesar's body is discovered, he flips his switch and goes berserk, winding up as an inmate in his own asylum. Are we good with that so far, yeah? So the roles of Caligari and Caesar from a story are adopted by the asylum's director and one of his patients. But oh no, why would it stop there? We wanted to get even more mental. How's about when we kick back to the present day, Francis isn't just sat in a park telling his story to an old man. This is the asylum, and Francis is an inmate. Jane, his fiance, is also an inmate, believing that she's a queen, and Caesar is also an inmate, but he's the complete opposite of a somnambulist. He's awake and doesn't appear to have any hostile traits. Caligari is no longer an inmate, as told by Francis. He's the director again, who now believes he understands Francis's condition. Bloody hell, man, how many twists do you want? So, right, let's take it from the top. Francis tells his story of what happened to Jane. In this story, Dr. Caligari and Caesar arrive to the town as a double act, but are really the asylum director and a patient. They commit a series of murders in tribute to a story. Caesar dies, Caligari is imprisoned. This is just Francis's perspective. In reality, it's all a delusion. And really, Francis, Jane and Caesar are all patients, with Caligari being the director. The whole film has been Francis's delusion. Or has it? There's theories that given the director's expression at the end, he still has that Caligari persona and that this is the lunatic running the asylum. Christ, this film isn't much longer than an hour and it's got a double, potentially triple twist. That's nightmare fuel to me in a video script writing sense more than anything else. And it baffles my brain how they came up with that combination of whammies to bring the film to a close. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is definitely one of the most iconic early horror films. The paths paved by the film for many more films to come cannot be overlooked. And though today it may not terrify, the nightmare fuel strength of Caligari is a psychological one. It transports you to a world unlike any other. It presents you with so many different narratives that you've got to question what you think is real and what isn't. It's got some spine-tingling horrific imagery, some of the most famous shots in horror movie history. It entrances you with Conrad Veidt's first gaze directly into the camera being a connection to the world over a century ago. The eyes are the windows to the soul, and here you can dive into his irises and experience the infancy of horror. That's why I think that that all these years later, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari deserves an honorary spot on our Nightmare Fuel Hall of Fame. Do you agree with its positioning? Let us know all your thoughts about Caligari in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this. Have a class Halloween from all of us at Unleash the Ghouls. I've been Connor, and I'll be lurking in the shadows of the fair, armed with another dose of Nightmare Fuel.